I think uh, we'll, we'll get started here. Uh, I am Lance Sorensen, uh, also a fellow in the Con Law Center here, and we have a great panel uh, for the last session of the day. Uh, to my far left is Laura Donahue from Georgetown uh, Law Center. And then we'll have uh, Jamal Green. This will be interspersed with our comments. And our last presenter will be uh, Michael Stokes Paulson. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn the time to Laura. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank Mike and the Constitution Center for inviting me today. It's great to be back at Stanford. Um, I, I loved my time here and it's, it's really nice to be back. In fact, when I first left Stanford, I went to Washington. One of the first cases I saw was Schwarzenegger versus EMA. I went to the case. Um, this was the case about whether violent video games could be restricted based on their content, whether they were violent or offensive to community values. Um, and there was this wonderful moment in the case when Justice Scalia was being particularly hard on counsel and Justice Justice Alito leaned forward and said, counsel, what Justice Scalia really wants to know is what did the founders think about video games? <laughs> you know, as an historian, I take the point. Um, I, see, I tend to see, though, many of the principles in the Constitution, um, including the First Amendment and others, as immutable, but the same critique can be brought to bear in other areas of the law. In this case, what I'd like to talk about is the Fourth Amendment, which has proven uh, utterly inadequate in a digital world. How do bits and bytes fit into houses, uh, persons' houses, papers, and effects? So if the Fourth Amendment is essentially about power, I reject the property-based concept, I reject the privacy-based concept, I see the Fourth Amendment as an originalist matter, as a restriction on government power, then what do you do when you have something new, which basically a new kind of power that emerges, which has a profound profound impact on individual rights. How do you restrain that power? And I'd like to ask for your support today for an amendment to do precisely this, uh, because the Fourth Amendment doctrine, which has been developed uh, in the wake of the founding, so to speak, is utterly inadequate for the world in which we find ourselves. Uh, technology has propelled us to this new era, and traits that are unique to a digital world are breaking down the distinctions on which the doctrine has built these protections. So consider, for instance, the dereption between private and public space. The court has long relied on that dichotomy to determine what constitutes a reasonable expectation of privacy. So the lines are drawn at the walls of our home, and individuals, when they go out into public, get fewer protections. There's this uh, two-step logic that actually holds here, which is when you leave your home, what you say and do can be seen and heard by others, and you shouldn't disadvantage law enforcement by forcing them to close their eyes or cover their ears. But if we look at the kind of information now available in a public sphere, it's just an exponential increase in data. We have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signals that can be collected. We have global positioning systems and vessel monitoring systems and radio frequency identification chips. We have automated license plate records that record the time, date, and location of cars. Network data reveals where your devices travel day and night. We have IMSI catchers. We have internet protocol databases that register your users' logins, where they're located. We have financial records, credit card records that put people in certain places at certain times with the understanding that what you do, where you go, and whom you're with when you do so is somehow not private. The digitization of that information means that it can be recorded and analyzed and combined with biographic information subject to algorithmic analyses, and it penetrates further and further into our lives. Even when data is derived from the public sphere, the government's use of it can impact free speech, the right to association, your right to assemble, to say nothing of personal privacy. Technology erodes other Fourth Amendment distinctions as well. We had a series of cases in the 1970s that established the contours of what is considered reasonable based on who holds that information. So data held by third parties is given fewer protections than what you hold yourself. The companies with whom one contracts for goods or services uh, have a low, you have a lower level of protection in that information. But technology has created this imbalance. We now have a world that's digitally dependent. You cannot go about your lives without creating this digital doppelganger that follows you around, and all of that information is held by third parties. It's absolutely central to how our society functions. New informations of information, moreover, are being generated, information that did not even exist before, uh, and our reliance on industry and third party providers to service these needs of daily life uh, has made much more use of our information, as well as new kinds of personal data that are now vulnerable to government collection. 
So that's so, so much for third-party data versus personal information. Yet there are other dichotomies that mark Fourth Amendment doctrine. So the type of information, think about content versus non-content. That collapses in a contemporary world. For years, envelope information has been considered non-content. And so it's less protected than content on the grounds that the latter, not the former, reveal your private communications, thoughts, and beliefs. But what happens when you go into a search engine and you enter a term and the URL, the record locator, shows exactly what it is you're reading, what, it is the infor what information you are seeking? What about metadata? It can reveal all sorts of information about individuals. In fact, law enforcement regularly uses search terms to bring criminal charges against individuals. And the reason for this is really simple. Patterns in phone calls, text messages, instant messaging, emails, or even URL visits, they demonstrate your beliefs, your relationships, your social networks, yet the form of that data, metadata, is not protected under the Fourth Amendment. Differentiating between domestic and international communications, another Fourth Amendment dichotomy, similarly is inapposite in our contemporary world. All of our communications are now global. If I meet, email a friend from a restaurant here in Palo Alto, and she reads the email while she's sitting in Washington, DC, that message may well have gone internationally, placing it under weaker Fourth Amendment standards, regardless of what I do. It may be domestic, it may be international, but mere, the, the mere fact of how the internet works determines whether that message goes internationally, not the substance of that communication, not what it actually means, and so it gets fewer privacy protections as a result. It's not that our privacy interest in communication is any different than it traditionally has been. It's just that digitization and the advent of worldwide communications networks have narrowed my right to privacy to that same information. How about cloud computing or Dropbox or Google Docs? Should our privacy depend and government power depend on whether Google decides to hold that in Singapore or in Palo Alto? And I suggest not. The problem has nothing to do with the interests that are implicated or the expanding power of the federal government, and it has everything to do with new technologies. These four dichotomies, public versus private space, personal versus third party data, content versus non-content, domestic versus international, these are breaking down. The proposed amendment addresses that gap caused by digitization. It acknowledges the failure of third party doctrine to recognize the deeper privacy interests entailed in the digitization of our lives, and it restores the ability of the court to expand our understanding of content. It also allows the court to depart from the terrestrial grounding of the Fourth Amendment. It's hard to think about bits and bytes which are non-terrestrial. They are non, they are borderless. They don't have any substantive form and persons, houses, papers, and effects does not adequately account for them. The point of this uh, would be to limit the steady accumulation of government power. The Second Amendment I'd like to briefly address uh, as well, it deals with ways in which the weaker protections that have been put into the sphere post 9-11 have now bled over into the criminal realm. Uh, together with the failure of the Fourth Amendment doctrine to provide a stopgap, I see these as one of the most serious threats to liberty today. So in September of 1968, as some of you will remember, a White Panther bomb destroyed the Central Intelligence Agency's offices in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In the case that followed US versus US District Court, uh, also commonly known as Keith, named after the judge uh, in the first uh, case that came up, the Supreme Court eventually held that the Attorney General's decision to authorize a warrantless wiretap of the suspected bombers violated the Fourth Amendment. Justice Powell explained that while the President had an Article Three duty, sorry, Article II duty, to protect the United States from threats to national security, the judiciary could not condone unchecked surveillance power. The danger was that the executive branch, acting under its own impetus, may yield too readily, he wrote, quote, to pressures to obtain incriminating evidence and overlook potential invasions of privacy and protected speech. The court advised Congress to pass a law reflecting the unique challenges of domestic security, as well as the importance of providing a check on the executive branch. The result was the 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That legislation placed domestic foreign intelligence collection using electronic means under the jurisdiction of a special court, instead of the probable cause standard in criminal law that an individual, of course, is committing, has committed, or is about to commit a crime. The statute only required probable cause that the individual to be targeted was a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. 
and probable cause that they were likely to use the facility to be placed under surveillance. Congress made it clear in that statute that it was to be the sole means via which domestic surveillance could be conducted. In the event of war, there was a 15-day window at the end of which the executive would have to return to Congress. Over the next two decades, Congress expanded the power to cover uh, not just electronic searches, but also physical searches, uh, pen registers, trap and trace devices, and search of business records, as well as tangible goods. Uh, these laws are considered traditional FISA. Now, following 9-11, the Bush administration authorized the domestic, warrantless collection of telephony and internet, metadata, and content entirely outside that legislative framework. The action contravened Congress's express direction supported by the court's decision in U.S. versus U.S. District Court that FISA was to be the sole means of intelligence collection. The executive then tried to shoehorn the existing programs into the FISA framework, and when they did not easily fit, Congress passed a new law called the FISA Amendments Act of 2008. Section 702, which incidentally is coming up uh, for renewal or will expire in December of this year, it provided the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence uh, for them jointly to authorize on an annual basis the targeting of individuals reasonably believed to be located outside the United States in order to collect foreign intelligence. So it collects on U.S. soil uh, the communications of individuals overseas who are being targeted. Well, it turned out in 2013 when documents were leaked to the press by Edward Snowden that the National Security Agency was using Section 702 to collect massive amounts of data, including communications to and from U.S. citizens, even entirely domestic conversations. So a key point of contention was the breadth of the information, the communications that were being monitored. In 2014, the Washington Post reported that the government had certified 193 countries, numerous international organizations like the World Bank, the IMF, the European Union, the International Atomic Energy, and others as targets. The number was staggering. According to the DNI in 2013, the one order, one order issued under 702 had 89,138 targets. In 2014, the estimated number of targets increased to 92,000, and again in 2015 to nearly 95,000 targets. Now, the intelligence community's interpretation of Section 702 falls outside Fourth Amendment bounds. Uh, the founders passed the Fourth Amendment, as all of you know, uh, precisely to prevent the government from issuing general warrants. But that's exactly how this statute operates. It monitors and collects Americans' international communications, as well as even entirely domestic conversations, without any oath or affirmation of wrongdoing. It does not apply to a particular person or place, it does not specify the records that are going to be obtained. The targets may be foreigners in other countries, but when the other end is domestic, then it's Americans' communications that are being intercepted. In addition, there's a bundling issue on the internet. So if you have multi-communication transactions and the target that's picked up is one communication, everything else that happens to be bundled with it on the internet also gets picked up. The NSA has further interpreted that law that anything about a target or a selector associated with a target may be picked up, which has given it an extremely wide net to collect all of this information. The FBI regularly queries this database for a totally unrelated criminal activity to look for potential evidence of wrongdoing. It is a general warrant under the classic understanding of the Fourth Amendment. And yet that's been rejected by the courts. The courts, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court says, well, under third party doctrine, the metadata is not included under Section 215. Under the special foreign intelligence exception, we can actually have this kind of information collected and it's all bleeding over into ordinary criminal law. According to the 2015 minimization procedures, the FBI can retain, process, and disseminate that information, even if, it, if, even if it relates to extremely sensitive personal matters, such as consulting with clergy. These are quotes from the actual minimization. One, consulting with clergy. Edu two, education records. Three, political activities, including discussions with members of Congress and their staff. Fourth, activities involving the press or other media. Fifth, sexual conduct. Sixth, medical and psychiatric appointments. Seventh, minors. In 2014, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board reported that the FBI frequently made use of this, this power. They don't even record the number of times they query it, looking for potential criminal activity. And 702 is certainly not the only intelligence collection program underway where national security is bleeding over into criminal law. This hemorrhaging must be stopped, in my view, before the body politic dies. Thank you.
Uh, we're going to have some comments from uh, Ruth Wedgwood uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Up, up to the podium, please. Well, I didn't quite know what Laura was going to say. Um, I come from a, actually, believe it or not, a lefty background, ILGWU, Ladies Garment Workers Union. Um, but what, one of my first jobs out of law school after working for Friendly and Blackman was to go work for Phil Hyman, who was this lovely man who ran the criminal division. And uh, we, we, people here probably know him. He was a pure Kennedy Democrat. Uh, thought the, well, he was quite innocent, actually. thought the world was a nice and charming place where nothing could go wrong. And if you had due process, nothing else could possibly interfere. Um, we did actually look at the FBI's uh, techniques and methods of intrusion and wrote undercover guidelines and informant guidelines and general crime guidelines with all kinds of slightly bureaucratic methods of uh, making records and having second looks. And that probably actually was useful because the old culture of J. Edgar Hoover still lived. And you had to have a generational cha change to get the bureau to be a little bit more gamified. Um, but I will tell you, for folks who haven't been prosecutors, it's very hard to prove cases. Like, really, really hard. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is really hard. And if a jury has one little itch that you don't scratch, you get an acquittal. So there, this, 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 what otherwise seems like Orwellian tendency to suck everything up, just comes naturally from the nature of the beast. You don't use everything. You would certainly handle things that are personal with great care. Uh, you do have to worry about people who just throw books records into boxes and leave them in the center room and never give them back again. I used to do that, actually. <laughs> it was a punishment for, if you, if you were a bad industrialist, I would take all your records and then leave the office and <laughs> you'd have to leave you to find them. Um, but that's a joke, it's sort of. <laughs> and and be, being investigated is very intrusive and it terrifies people. But if you really do believe in good proof, not just suppositions and generalizations and prophylactic measures that may sweep too many people before it, then you have to be very pointillistic in how you assemble proof. And that requires exactitude and stuff. So, and if you don't like the idea of a world of confessions, where you get your information either by uh, intimidating people or misrepresenting who you are, or um, in some sense beguiling them to think that you're acting in their interest when you're not, um, then you have to do it other ways, which is usually through paper and electronics. And th there is nothing worse, I have to say, than a, a, a bad conviction. I will just give you one example, which should douse my credit, of course, I wouldn't tell you. Uh, but once I had a little bitty nothing case about some bl black kid who had been a bank teller, and he said that he was stuck up um, and therefore had to give the money over, over or else be killed. And uh, the FBI had gone in and done a fairly summary job. They had just talked to the bank teller and decided he was lying and arrested him. And then the question was, what do you do to, to try to uh, obviate what might not be righteously obtained guilt? And I went over, it, 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 as we all know, you always have to go yourself and look, whether it's cleaning up your house or interviewing somebody. So I went to the bank, bank branch and uh, up on the wall I saw a camera which was taking pictures the entire time, and the Bureau hadn't gotten it. So one got the camera and correlated all the frames with the time that the event was said to have taken place. And that's what made me, in fact, uh, fight Rudy and say there really was reasonable doubt. So the ethos of the people who do investigating, whether it's for the CIA, DIA, FBI, whoever, uh, really does matter. It has to be an organization that has an ethos that takes truth seriously, that has empathy with, for people who get swept up in its wake. Um, who know really where you are likely to find good evidence, because it, it, it is an art form, in fact. Where, where would it be that they didn't think I'd be looking? Um, but it, 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 at least I think good lawyers, maybe not in law schools, not, not when I was in law school, but facts are everything, and care is everything, and imagination and how you can prove or disprove things is everything. So that, I think, is an undervalued skill. Now, on the, on the actual um, life history of the, of the FBI and CIA, DIA, there are an awful lot of agencies. Uh, they, have, they did, over time, as you know, try to regularize the use of, of uh, foreign wiretaps. So now there is the FISA court, and folks like uh, uh, Judge Cabranes and others serve on it to authorize wires. So it's better than it used to be. Its standards are still a little bit unknowable. Um, and I do think that, that again, with Hoover leaving and with the advent of Judge Webster, there really was a generational 
changed at the Bureau, and now they have females, blacks, and Jews, all kinds of people at the Bureau, which they didn't used to have. Um, but still, it's, it's an area where I guess, I don't know how you investigate somebody's conscience, but if you have somebody who's sloppy, who just doesn't care, uh, you can get some terrible results and some true miscarriages of justice. I think the more worrisome place, frankly, often is at local state and, state and, state and local law, law enforcement, where they don't have much money, where they don't have anybody watching over them, where they are, I think it's probably good enough for government work, and at least the guy will do three weeks in the slammer waiting for trial. And at state and local, I think, is where, in fact, if I was doing a major law reform project, one minute, I, one minute, <laughs> I, I, would, I, would, I would invest my time. So I, I don't think the world is Orwellian necessarily because of the government. I think just the absolute floriation of every form of electronics that measures when you breathe, when you pee, when you, when, when you, breathe, when you, when you think, um, has made this just a digitalized world of observation. And uh, one has to live with that. It's not going to go away. And, and trying to police it would probably be almost as intrusive as the as the uh, acts themselves. So I, 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 in principle, I agree with everything Laura said, but uh, in I think in practice it's quite a bit more complicated. Jamal Green. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers of the conference, and uh, particularly Michael McConnell. Uh, uh, and I want to especially thank him for uh, as he also often does, bringing together in uh, civil conversation people from a wide range of political and ideological perspectives. Uh, and I think the, the, the rest of the country could certainly learn from, uh, from this McConnell, uh, who's the good one. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, in the spirit of bipartisanship. Uh, so the, the, the uh, earlier... Um, uh, earlier, I made a comment to George Thomas in, in, uh, in which I uh, suggested that there was a, a constitutional amendment that I sort of liked but, but wasn't sure if I liked for our Constitution. Uh, so just to show that I'm not that parochial, I've borrowed uh, uh, in, in jot and tittle, uh, almost, uh, a, uh, the Section 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, as my proposed constitutional amendment. Uh, and so it, it basically sets out a limitations clause uh, for the rights guarantees in the Constitution. Uh, so I'll, I'll say just first a little bit about why I think this kind of amendment is needed, uh, and then say something even more brief about how I think it might work. Uh, so put most briefly, uh, the amendment acknowledges that rights have limitations uh, and invites, implicitly invites courts to flesh out uh, those limitations through some doctrinal framework. Uh, you might say, uh, well, we, we all know that. We all know that rights have uh, limitations. Uh, even the strictest uh, formulation in U.S. constitutional law, strict, strict scrutiny, uh, acknowledges that in some, in some instances um, there are limitations on rights. And uh, you could just glance at uh, American affirmative action doctrine uh, to note that sometimes those limitations matter. And in fact, uh, uh, strict scrutiny is not, so to speak, fatal in fact. Uh, now, while it's true uh, that in practice courts, of course, uh, and the Supreme Court, of course, limits uh, rights all the time, uh, I think that how the court frames uh, those limits and how it approaches its task uh, matters uh, quite a lot uh, and needs to change. Uh, there's, a, there's a standard uh, sort of black letter, uh, those of you who teach constitutional law um, uh, or have taken the bar would uh, n uh, be familiar with uh, the kind of black letter law here um, that approaches a rights question in a way that is essentially born out of um, Caroline products and the post um, New Deal uh, framework, uh, but I think has since evolved in ways that are neither desirable nor uh, sustainable. Uh, the standard way is this, of course, assume um, as a default uh, that the plaintiff complaining about some governmental action or regulation has no right. Uh, so this is ordinary social and economic legislation um, in the language of Caroline products. Uh, the test uh, is minimum rationality. We expect the government to win those cases. Uh, but of course, recognizing that sometimes people, in fact, do have rights, um, we've tried to hive off uh, some special um, predetermined and categorical um, set of situations in which we want courts um, to apply some form of heightened scrutiny. 
Um, and so this is what the Carolyn products footnote four is really about, uh, uh, where, uh, which is, so is it, does it involve uh, a, a restriction on the rights of discrete, or discrete and insular minorities, um, or does it in, in, impede the operation of the political process? Is it explicit in the Bill of Rights, and, and so forth. Uh, so basically all of constitutional law uh, involving rights claims since the 1940s has been arguments about what kinds of claims fall into which kinds of categories. And of course, since two categories, minimum rationality or strict scrutiny, um, is obviously too crude, we proceed to create additional um, bespoke categories, intermediate scrutiny, um, special doctrines for certain kinds of rights, uh, uh, every fundamental right has its own doctrine associated with it. We've talked about the right to vote in that, in that um, context earlier. Um, and so with a few exceptions, I, I think of procedural due process as an exception to this, but with a few, with a few exceptions, this is basically how things work uh, across doctrinal areas in US constitutional law. We engage in an interpretive inquiry, um, sometimes based on crude history, um, sometimes based on crude sociology, uh, uh, to decide whether to put particular kinds of claims into particular predetermined categories that we expect to drive the inquiry. Is it, does it fall into the third party doctrine category and therefore that will tell you something about how the case is supposed to be decided. And when those categories fail to drive the inquiry, um, as in affirmative action cases or as in cases involving um, undocumented minors or as in LGBT cases, um, we accuse the court of lawlessness uh, and we do so I think with good reason. Um, this state of affairs uh, leads to at least two problems um, that concern me. Um, one is, as noted, obfuscation. Uh, we have a whole host of doctrinal and subdoctrinal areas where the court uh, purports to apply one level of scrutiny but actually seems to be applying another. Uh, or where the court declines without any explanation um, to use uh, established doctrinal frameworks. Um, when we know the real reason is fear of the consequences, of applying particular categories, um, or uh, when it strains credulity, credulity yeah, uh, to fit a particular fact situation um, into a particular category, but the court does so anyway. Um, I'm thinking here, for example, of the recent uh, First Amendment case involving whether Texas could put uh, could allow people to put Confederate flags on their license plates, um, where the court said ludicrously uh, that uh, that this was government speech, um, even though individual drivers were the ones who chose what to put on their license plates and, and, and those included go sooners, for example, and this was Texas. Um, uh, this kind of obfuscation is a rule of law problem. Uh, the second problem uh, concerns me even more. Um, and this is the problem of the court deciding in advance not to pursue certain kinds of rights at the, th at the threshold level um, for fear that the categorical framework the court uses prevents the court from drawing qualitative context sensitive distinctions down the line. So for example, uh, the court rejects in the San Antonio case a right to education and therefore applies rational basis review uh, uh, notwithstanding um, some obvious injustice in the way in which schools, uh, school financing um, works uh, because it says it will destroy local education uh, uh, to do otherwise um, or because it thinks that it would therefore commit itself to some totalizing right to food or right to shelter or some other such right. Uh, so it doesn't even give an inch um, because it's worried about these downstream consequences. Uh, another example, uh, the court refuses to say, and this came up earlier, refuses to say that even the most massive uh, and most unnecessary disparate impact uh, 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 is of no constitutional concern, none whatsoever, because it fears it will thereby need to remake all of American law. Uh, the court says this more or less explicitly in Washington versus Davis. Um, another set of examples, from the other side, politically, uh, the court refuses to recognize a right to contract, um, the court refuses to allow for the possibility of fetal rights uh, because it believes it cannot control the consequences or cannot adjudicate cases um, that involve rights claims or, right or, or, or constitutionally inspired values on both sides of the ledger. Uh, I think that this is not a way to do constitutional law. Uh, constitutional judges have very difficult jobs. Um, those require very difficult judgments. Um, court, courts should not pretend otherwise. Uh, a limitations clause of the sort above, I use the Canadian Constitution because the, Canadians, uh, uh, the Canadian framework has, has been very influential around the world, uh, I, 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 what I think, uh, my, I hope, uh, make that more clear. Uh, make more clear that in a complex society uh, and in a mature democracy, the paradigm case in which a litigant claims a right 
is not one in which the government in bad faith is acting lawlessly and wantonly, uh, as was, for example, the case during Jim Crow. The paradigm case, which is not to say the only cases, but the paradigm case, is one in which the dispute implicates both an injury that should be taken seriously and a right of the people to self-governance that should be taken equally seriously. Uh, the court's first instinct should be, in such a society, uh, to facilitate political deliberation over, com over conflicting um, interests. Um, not to write an opinion that looks like a brief um, that declares that one side is the winner and the other side um, is saying something of no constitutional concern or constitutional dimension. Uh, and that's what that I think that that latter dystopian framework is what the categorical um, inquiry encourages. Uh, now, lots of um, constitutional and apex uh, courts around the world um, have what are by now very well established uh, proportionality frameworks. Um, that attempt to encourage exactly this kind of dialogue. Uh, I'm not, uh, as, as Michael Greber earlier said, I'm not, I'm not particularly wedded to a, an, a particular doctrinal proportionality formulation. Um, the, standard, uh, the standard proportionality frameworks um, tend to be, um, and they're typically forgiving in allowing plaintiffs to make out a prima facie case um, that some constitutional right um, is at stake uh, but then the focus, the weight of the court's inquiry is not on, de on deciding whether that right is one the Constitution recognizes. The weight of the inquiry, as it should be in a complex society, uh, is uh, on the rationality, the efficiency, and the proportionality of the government's actions. Uh, so I think a, a similar and, tr and transubstantive across rights areas, a similar transubstantive mode of inquiry uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, especially if accompanied by greater remedial flexibility than the court tends to entertain uh, would, I think, uh, be a step in the direction of encouraging rational and deliberative political decision making uh, and a step in the direction of reducing um, the political polarization that is, uh, I think, quite literally destroying the country. Uh, we'll have some comments on Jamal's amendment from Jeff Sigalet from the Stanford Con Law Center. Thank you very much. Um, the title of my comments are a U.S. Limitations Clause. Uh, sorry. Um, so <laughs> as, a, as a Canadian, um, that is a North American with an inferiority complex. Um, it's always wonderful to, uh, to have our southern neighbors recognize us. Um, and the fact that we have a constitution. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk about um, submitting a major part of our constitution into uh, the United States Constitution. Um, however, unfortunately, uh, I, uh, I have some, some qualms about this part of our own constitution. So my main comment on uh, Professor Green's amendment um, is to recognize the inferiority of the Canadian Constitution um, concerning its limitations clause. Um, and so uh, I think I'll recommend uh, that the United States steer clear of this kind of thing. But before getting into uh, why the United States should reject a limitations clause like section one of the charter, um, I should I should uh, say that it should be one thing to clarify right away is whether or not this proposed amendment uh, would actually apply to all of the rights in the U.S. Constitution, uh, including the provisions of the constitutional articles uh, delimiting structural things that could be and, and individual things that could be called rights. Um, so you could think of uh, uh, the right of uh, certain individuals over 36 to be president or whatever. Um, is that subject to proportionality analysis because you have a limitations clause? And the reason I say this is because that's pretty significant, that this, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is just one part of the Canadian Constitution, and so the limitations clause doesn't apply to many other individual rights you find uh, throughout the Constitution, the Canadian Constitution. So the right to, of uh, Catholics and Protestants in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario to uh, public edu education. I know that's kind of a weird thing for, to, that sounds weird to Americans because you have an establishment clause. Um, but th that right isn't subject to proportionality analysis. It just came up in a, a decision three weeks ago um, uh, from the uh, Saskatchewan uh, Court of Queen's Bench, um, a decision that's now going to be 
have the notwithstanding clause applied to it, um, and so it'll be overturned. We were talking about that earlier. Um, so that's one question about this. Is it going to apply to the entire Constitution? Um, and it seems quite radical if it is, to me, uh, even more radical than our uh, notwithstanding clause. Um, I should also point out really quickly that there are, that in uh, Professor Green's discussion of this amendment, um, he has uh, presupposed that this limitations clause will result in proportionality analysis uh, along the lines of uh, the kind of, an, of form of analysis, uh, the prongs of analysis developed in uh, the Oaks, uh, the, the classic Canadian case, the Oaks case, which we draw this from, which is actually, it's not, it's very influential around the world, it's true, but Justice Dixon, the rumor is, at least, the, it's public knowledge, really, that Justice Dixon's uh, clerk, who's now a certain professor at the University of British Columbia, actually just copied the, the German version of this down and changed it a little bit to, to fit the Canadian Charter. Um, so we're, we're not actually responsible for it. It's a German <laughs> disease. Um, so so uh, uh, I should note, though, that like, uh, in as much as uh, Professor Green's uh, characterized the clause as implying proportionality analysis, some Canadian constitutional law scholars um, have argued that the idea of limiting, uh, the, 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 word, the word limit in, the, in, the, in section one of the charter, um, the charter reads subject only, that rights are guaranteed subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, that that shouldn't be read as over, allowing the over, override of limitations but is setting boundaries or delimitations of the scope and content of rights. And that brings me to uh, my, my basic objection um, to, uh, to, to subjecting the poor United States Constitution to this uh, Canadian disease, um, <laughs> uh, which is just, it's just a, general, a general problem that has, that has come up with, uh, that, I think, that, that I think plagues the uh, jurisprudence uh, involving Section 1 of the Charter. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting problems that I think would arise if we discussed how it would actually work its way, work its way out um, in the U.S. context. But the overall um, argument, I think, of professor, that Professor Green has offered is that this, this will provide a more consistent standard than the various tiers and kinds of, of scrutiny um, and, and, and potential limitations that you have uh, currently in the United States Constitution. But I don't think it's that consistent. Um, and that's my main objection to it. I think it's actually rather arbitrary. Um, and this is because this simple, simply comes from, a, from thinking about what it means to, to I'm, I'm, and I confess I'm not a fan of the idea of overriding rights, and I'm not sure I'm convinced that uh, the idea makes sense uh, in and of itself in, in terms of just thinking about what rights are in the philosophy of law. Um, but, and so I don't necessarily buy the consistency of any standard for overriding or balancing rights. But I think in order to justify subjecting the entire U.S. Constitution to this Canadian-style limitations clause, um, the burden of proof is on demonstrating the consistency of the Canadian uh, standard. And I think that standard's not that consistent. So, and consi why does consistency matter? Well, consistency matters because we think rights are, are somewhat uh, related to justice. Um, in another part of the charter, we, it, it says that too, so, but we don't need to get into that. Um, uh, we think that um, there's something there's some something about uh, justice involves consistency. It can't demand and deny the same thing. So just rights should be consistent. They they specify what ought to be done, and they can't specify X and also specify not X. Now the problem um, is that if rights can be legally overridden according to justifiable limits, then the definition of rights and analysis con concerning the infringements of rights will become unrelated to other rights and interests as, because such factors will only come into play at the second stage of evaluating whether or not rights have been justifiably infringed. So then rights become understood as expansive interests unrelated to other rights interests that are also defeasible when they're related to each other in the second stage. So Canadian proportionality analysis only achieve its consistency in this two-step analysis by defining rights non-relationally at the first stage and just exhausting their, their meaning, what they are at that first stage, and then presupposing in the second stage that all of these non-relationally defined rights are commensurable 
which is something you'd expect that, uh, the, the standards of commensurability is something you'd expect to be worked out in the first stage when you say, oh, what is this right? What is this related to? What interest is it expressing? How does this relate to another right? Where does it end? Where does it start? Um, and how do those interests relate? How are they commensurable? This way of thinking about it just says, well, this, this right needs to, to know what, whether or not this right's been violated. Don't look at any other rights. Look at the right and then think about, and then we'll look at what, how it's commensurable with all these other rights. But that presupposes that every right in our charter is con commensurable. Um, and to me, this is very problematic. Um, if the interests protected by every right were clearly commensurable with other rights and, and other interests, then the test might be consistent. But I'm just completely unaware of uh, any obvious and philosophically uncontroversial common measure for evaluating uh, something like the social importance of free expression uh, as it relates to, let's say, human life. This doesn't, the, the relationship between them, uh, what, how they're weighted, doesn't seem obvious to me. Um, so on proportionality analysis, rights become prima facie defined by their semantic content, such that freedom of expression can rationally be thought to extend to rape, murder, etc., or any activity, actually, that conveys meaning as opposed to being defined by the specification of their scope and content in relationship to other constitutional provisions and statutes. Their commensurability with other rights and interests is simply presupposed and not defined at the first stage. So that's why the most famous proportionality analysis uh, theorists like Kai Muller and, and uh, 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 Alexei uh, have argued that uh, there's a right to murder or rape somebody as a matter of free expression. It's just not justifiable. If that seems odd to you, then you probably aren't a fan of proportionality analysis. Um, and indeed, in its section one analysis of freedom of expression, one of the landmark cases on this, in Irwin Toy versus Quebec, the Canadian court followed these theorists by referring to rape as a form of expression. It conveys meaning, although they didn't go so far as to say it was a freedom of expression, but they didn't explain why. Uh, why, that, why, 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 that, why, it's, why it's not covered under that right then. Um, and it didn't offer any reasons why laws against these crimes, against rape, um, are, is not a, are not an infringement, of, however justified, of freedom of expression. So I submit that if Section 7, uh, Section 7 Charter Right to Life and the Canadian Criminal Code Prohibition of Murder, um, activities that convey meaning, uh, if, if the Charter protects right, life, the right to life um, and prohibits, prohibits murder, and a theory of practical reasoning about rights suggests that these rights infringe rather than help specify the content and scope of the Section 2B right to freedom of expression, then that theory of practical reasoning about rights suggests that I have an unjustifiable right to kill someone to express my love for animals. <laughs> what consistent measure is a judge to use when evaluating whether limiting the right to kill someone to express a love for animals involves a pressing objective which minimally and, proportional, and proportionately impairs the right to freedom of expression. I submit that there is none, or at least that it is not obvious enough that it could be safely presupposed by judges without threatening the people's control over the meaning um, of their democratically specified rights, either by amendment or by statute. I would argue that admitting such an inconsistent standard of analysis into US law will, in the words of the proportionality theorist Matthias Kuhn, provides courts with, and I quote, a noble lie disguised to dupe, and I quote again, and I'm not kidding, this is actually from a scholarly article, the uninitiated hoi polloi who do not understand the, and I quote again, the esoteric need to import extra legal moral reasoning into legal decision making. So that seems like a bad idea to me. Thank you. Our final uh, presenter for this uh, session will be Michael Stokes Paulson. Well, it's always fun to be the final presenter at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, <laughs> being the last thing between you and that first glass of wine. So I'll try to make it as efficient as possible, but I am a law professor. I'm, I apologize in advance. I do want to say that I'm honored to be here, and it's great to see so many old friends and to make so many new friends. Uh, thanks to Mike McConnell, who's been a friend of mine since I first met him when I was a summer clerk, and he was an assistant in the Solicitor General's office in the summer 
of 1984. So I've known Michael for 33 years. And I want to thank Mark uh, Storsley for accommodating my schedule. He juggled the order of the panels because I have to leave tonight for, for a dubious reason. I'm, I'm taking the red eye in order to make it home in time for law school graduation. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, what? You go to graduation? Professors put on robes and they're mere props. And, and it's true, but if none of them showed up, and you know, I'm not doing this because a dean makes me. That, I just want to make that clear. But there will be some students who are graduating. I want to meet their family. So I want to apologize to all of you who present tomorrow for my running out tonight. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I have a yellow handout that accompanies this, and there probably aren't enough to go around, but it'll give you sort of the bullet points, and maybe there are a few more that can be spread around. The title of my talk is a Rules of Construction Amendment, Abolishing Judicial Activism by Statute or by Amendment. Okay, and I'll tell you the story of this. My original idea here was, could Congress pass a statute abolishing judicial activism. You know, I was jogging along the beach in Florida one glorious morning on spring break. I live in Minnesota, so glorious mornings in spring break are, are truly inspirational. And I thought, what a wonderful world this is, but if only we could abolish judicial activism. And I was wondering what a statute might look like that would abolish judicial activism. And what's on the screen is essentially what I initially thought of as a, con as a statute. Now the question, the inspiration for it came to me because I'm a civil procedure teacher and I teach the Rules of Decision Act where Congress specifies what are the substantive rules applicable in diversity jurisdiction cases. And I was wondering, could Congress do the same thing with respect to federal question jurisdiction? You know, specify what is the applicable governing law. Um, the problem with the proposal, or the potential problem, is is it constitutional, right? Does Congress have the power to do this? And does it in some way interfere with the constitutional assignment of the judicial power? For a lot of reasons, I think it's actually perfectly defensible. I actually think that each of these provisions here in a certain way reflects the actual current correct meaning of the Constitution. It just sort of specifies it. That's a controversial proposition. Um, but I think this could all be defended on uh, statutory grounds as being consistent with rules that Congress could prescribe for the exercise of the judicial power in ways faithful to the actual constitutional language. But suppose I'm wrong, right? When I've presented this at other law schools as a statute, they say, well, I agree with your proposal, but I don't think you can do it by statute. So I thought, well, you know, look, well, let's look at it as a constitutional uh, amendment, okay? Um, and now, even though I think that all of this is perfectly constitutional, I still think it qualifies for Michael's big fix, right? The idea that this is a big fix. Many of the most important constitutional amendments in our document are essentially interpretive amendments or clarifying amendments or specifying amendments of other amendments. And as I said in commenting on Marianne Case's proposal earlier today, I don't see anything wrong with redundancy and clarification as long as you are clear that you are not changing what you understand to be the pre-existing rules but sort of confirming them. And I also agree with something Randy Barnett said that the structural amendments are more important than the substantive amendments. And I think in some ways this is an important structural amendment because the power to interpret the other provisions of the document it, really, that's the 500-pound gorilla, right? You know, it is the uber power of interpretation. And sometimes I reinforce this by, by posing a question. I'll offer you a deal. There were a lot of amendments, the substance of which I don't think I would agree with. But I'll be happy to sign on to every one of your constitutional amendments as long as you sign on to me being in charge of interpreting them according to whatever criteria I like. The interpretive power is essentially the entire power. Okay, so that's my setup. Let me just walk you through the constitutional provisions with a little bit of commentary, and uh, then you can take pot shots at me. Um, section one says, in any case or controversy arising under the Constitution, the statutes or treaties of the United States, of which court of the United States or any state has jurisdiction, the rules of decision shall be supplied by the relevant texts 
of the Constitution, statutes, or treaties of the U.S. taken in context and understood according to the original public meaning of the language used at the time of the adoption, enactment, or ratification of the provisions involved. Section 1 essentially prescribes original public meaning, whole text in context, textualism as an interpretive mode. It is a specific rules of construction provision. Now in my outline, I note that I've written an article some years ago in Northwestern University uh, Law Review entitled, Does the Constitution Prescribe Rules for Its Own Interpretation? And I take the somewhat provocative position that yes, if you actually read the Constitution carefully, it specifies textualism. This Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The American people hereby adopt this Constitution. The ratification of this Constitution shall be effective. And then I go on to explain how you can actually understand the Constitution's text as specifying some proper form of textualism as the appropriate mode of constitutional interpretation. You might agree with that. You might disagree with that. In any event, it is a point that can be clarified, and Section 1 specifies that clarification. There are further clarifications that could be added. This doesn't go all the way. It doesn't resolve every case, but I think it does enact a significant reform. Section 2 then deals with the problem, well, we've had a lot of past interpretations that aren't consistent with this methodology prescribed in Section 1. And here's my rule. If a court of the U.S. or of any state in a case or controversy where the statute, Constitution statutes or treaties of the United States supplies a rule of decision determines that a prior judicial interpretation of a provision of the Constitution statute is contrary to or at variance with said provision. In other words, <clears throat> if the prior judicial decision is contrary to the interpretive rules specified in Section 1, the relevant provision of the Constitution statute or treaty of the United States shall supply the rule of decision not the prior judicial interpretation contrary to or at variance with such provision. In other words, I abrogate stare decisis. And I think this is for a good reason. <clears throat> On the premise that the Constitution says one thing and the judicial interpretation is at variance with it, you should go with the Constitution as opposed to the variance every time. That's actually the argument for judicial review in Marbury versus Madison. Constitution says one thing, government has done something contrary to it, Constitution wins. Apply it to judicial decisions departing from the Constitution's actual meaning. Constitution says one thing, judicial decision misinterpreting it says something else, you should go with the Constitution over the prior judicial departure from it every single time. Stare decisis is unconstitutional. If it wasn't before, it is now by virtue of my section two which is specified. Okay? No, ju no judge should deliberately adhere to what they believe is a faithless interpretation of the Constitution. I extend that in brackets even to lower court judges, and I actually stick with that. I, I think that's actually consistent with the best understanding of Article III structure, but that's a lecture for another time. And we're you know, getting closer to that first glass of wine. Section 3 then says, nothing in this act shall be construed to repeal or alter any statute prescribing the jurisdiction of any court, to invalidate or reopen any final judgment, or to prescribe the result to be reached in any specific case or controversy. In other words, this, this statute, or if enacted as an amendment, does not strip jurisdiction. It does not prescribe specific outcomes. It does not dictate specific conclusions in specific cases. It is all an interpretive methodology on a clean slate, applying proper principles. But then there's a proviso, and I think we should definitely keep this one. Provided, however, that no judgment, decree, opinion, or order issued in violation of this act or amendment shall be considered binding on the President of the United States or on the Congress of the United States in the exercise of their independent constitutional responsibilities. In other words, the purpose of this provision is to fortify and reinforce what I think is already the correct rule, that the power of constitutional interpretation is not a power specifically and exclusively vested in the judiciary, but divided and shared by multiple actors within our constitutional system. And of course, I wrote a law review article or two about that too, and I've provided that citation for you. If the judiciary has issued a ruling contrary to the understanding of the Constitution, it should not be binding 
on the independent checking exercise of powers of the other branches of government. I think that is the rule now. It is honored in the breach. And if it isn't the rule now, it is the rule as soon as you adopt my constitutional amendment. Now, I know some of you are saying, this is actually radical. No, this isn't. This just confirms the proper original meaning of the Constitution and restores and clarifies everything. Some of you will say, this would be terrible, you know, all this original meaning stuff. I hate that original meaning stuff. But I want to put this point to you to think about as you listen to other people's proposals and to other critics' commentaries on those proposals. I think that we are all secret clandestine originalists. That we actually subscribe to the view that the meaning of text is, is supplied by the public linguistic meaning of the words used. And here's my challenge to you. Those of you who are proposing other amendments, what are the interpretive rules you would like to have people use when reading and applying your amendment proposal? What are the rules of understanding your language that you expect people to be applying when criticizing them? Okay. We are all secretly originalists. My statute or constitutional amendment merely restores the Constitution as it was always meant to be. The first pot shot will be taken by Jane Schachter. <laughs> Turns out I'm the last one standing between you and your, your first <laughs> glass of wine. So um, I could be very short up here and, and, and say to Michael, there is no abolishing judicial activism. This, this amendment is not going to abolish judicial activism. But um, I have a few more things to say than that. Um, so I'm not an originalist, um, but I think in five minutes we won't hash that out. Um, <laughs> I'm an originalist, perhaps in the way you described it, that everyone is going to start with the uh, with the um, meaning of the meaning of the provision. But where are we going to go from there? And you said, how would we want our uh, own amendments to be interpreted? Well, I actually had a little opportunity for that because I think it was Lance asked me the question. Well, what about um, halfway houses and what about uh, work release programs? I didn't really have an answer for work release programs. And so I sort of, you know, riffed on purpose and, you know, which direction it should be in. But that's going to happen. That's going to happen a lot. The, test, the text is going to run out. So we're going to need some more things to look at. So I'm, I'm all for starting with the text and ending with it if it's clear. But when it's not clear, what do we do then? Um, so what I thought would be an interesting um, exercise would be to think about what the world looks like under the Paulson rule. So it's in our constitution, and it says we're supposed to look at the original public meaning of constitutional provisions and of statutes, and we're, uh, we're getting rid of precedent if, it's, uh, if, it, if it didn't capture the, the correct understanding of the text. I think it, the world will look different, but maybe not as different as we think in the following sense. Um, my experience, not only in constitutional interpretation, but studying statutory interpretation, is that it always ends up being the case that the interpretive rules also need interpretation. <laughs> so in statutory interpretation, you know, those are typically canons of construction. There can be a fight about which one to use. Well, Michael has chosen one for us, so it's right there in the, uh, in the text. Um, but what what uh, the way it's construed, what judges make of it, can vary, right? And so think about the rule of lenity or the rule of avoiding constitutional questions. There's lots of different versions of these principles, and everything depends upon which one is used and what the trigger is for it. So I think that's going to be a reality. Um, the other thing is that sometimes there are interpretive directions that go along with statutes, either something like the Dictionary Act in the US Code or specific interpretive directions that uh, go along with a particular statute. And as often as not, they get ignored. 
So there's that problem. And you say, well, they're not gonna, you, the, the judges aren't going to ignore something in the Constitution, are they? Well, think about the Ninth <laughs> Amendment. I mean, that's a pretty good rule of interpretation that largely gets in, ignored. So there's that possibility. Um, so suppose it doesn't get ignored. Well, I think then we're, we're starting to narrow down to you know, a significant role, but which version of original public meaning are we going to use? I mean, we could talk about Heller and... Scalia's original public meaning versus Stevens' original intent. And we understand what the difference is between those two things in this room. Are all judges going to understand and or observe the distinction? Maybe not. But even within original public meaning, setting aside original intention, I'm going to guess that there are some originalists <coughs> in the room. And I'm going to guess that if I polled you, a number of you would probably say that you don't think uh, the Equal Protection Clause, as originally understood, would protect access for a same-sex couple to get married, right? I always thought, I'm not an originalist, I'm a supporter of same-sex marriage, I always thought that was kind of a loopy argument. But it's an argument that was made in, in extended form by, for example, um, Steve Calabresi, who's been, you know, who's got a genre now of these. Um, I can deliver these rights to you on an original public meaning analysis. And what does he say? He says, well, uh, if you, you know, if you, if you look at what, if you understand the Equal Protection Clause to have banned class legislation and caste legislation, uh, laws that don't allow same-sex couples to marry fit into that category. So what does he do? He ratchets up the level of generality and exploits the uncertainty about level of generality to a way that gets that result. Same argument by Bill Eskridge. Now, I think he was just being an originalist for the day, because he's not really an originalist. <laughs> and maybe all of this is sort of inspired by Jack Balkin in some way. Um, so that's another, those are, uh, you know, I was thinking of saying I have two words for you, Jack Balkin, and that, you know, that might, that, uh, that might take care of it. Um, just uh, moving uh, for a minute to precedent. Um, so you really want to get rid of precedent. You really want to get rid of stare decisis. That seems to me a little bit of overkill. Um, uh, maybe an invitation to some chaos, high costs in terms of stability, and reliance, because courts can overrule uh, constitutional precedents. In fact, I mean, I think you treat constitutional and statutory precedents the same way, certainly an argument to treat them differently, because it's easier for Congress to override a statute than it is for you know, uh, the people to amend the Constitution to override a constitutional decision, although <laughs> Congress is it's, it's getting harder and harder, but still. Um, but, but courts can and do overrule precedent, you know, massage precedent, ignore precedent. And so I guess I wonder, has the case been made that we really need to get rid of precedent or stare decisis? Um, uh, because it's, it's, it's a pretty high cost proposition. Are there more kind of uh, tailored or uh, restrained ways that we might deal with, with some of the issues? So I'll leave it there. Uh, we have about 10 to 12 minutes for uh, some questions. So, Randy. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just want an announcement to make, just in case you think that these academic conferences have no real-world implication. While we were speaking, approximately 90 minutes to two hours ago, Missouri became the 12th state to call for a convention of the states. <laughs> so everybody here should pat themselves on the back <laughs> for having had such a real-world impact. We're now one step closer to having to deal with constitutional amendments. That's only because I haven't actually conveyed word to them yet that I've had second thoughts about the entire idea as a result of this conference. Back quickly, Randy, please. Second the second thoughts uh, on that one. But my question's for Jamal, and um, the real question is, does this really just restore uh, the jurisprudence of the court to pre-Caroline product standards, which I would applaud, right? I mean, you were very good in terms of how the court sort of manipulates the different categories and goes back and forth, and then, you know, is this really a right? Is it not a right? Does it impinge on the democratic process? Does it not? Um, and so unlike your uh, commentator from Canada, I want to know if it's much more simple than that, really, that it really just invokes a kind of yik wo standard and says, that it's got to be a reasonable regulation. And then the question is, because your amendment doesn't specify, who determines what's reasonable? And I'm 
guessing um, from your comments that you're suggesting the court with a kind of intermediary standard uh, rather than the legislature, right, which is really the problem with rationality review because it, it's too deferential. And so does that capture what you're up to with your amendment? So uh, I'm not committed to a, a particular uh, jurisprudence. So I would not say this is Yikwo or this is Lochner. I certainly wouldn't say that. Uh, uh, and, and in that sense, uh, part, it's part of my response to Michael Stokes Paulson is I'm, I'm not sure if I would characterize my own decision rule as originalist. I'm perfectly willing to let the common law take hold of the standard and apply it in practical ways going forward. Uh, I will say that I do think the Lochner, that Lochner itself uh, is, uh, does um, perform a form of proportionality analysis. It's a I think it's an under-theorized, under-specified form. Uh, I think that Lochner is wrong in the merits, uh, but, uh, but I don't think Lochner is wrong methodolo methodologically. Um, and, uh, and, I, I, and, and so in that sense, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with the notion that the way in which the court should understand rights is, uh, is in the way in which the Lochner court understood rights, <clears throat> which is to say uh, 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 that uh, rights have a prima facie character. Uh, uh, I, and so uh, as to deference to a legislature um, uh, I th and who makes the decision of reasonableness, I think the court makes the decision of reasonableness. But I don't think that deference is incompatible with proportionality. I think you can, you can, you can construct the doctrine in such a way that um, gives some degree of deference to legislatures, particularly in certain kinds of situations. So, um, uh, so you know, one step in the Oaks test is... Uh, minimal impairment. So does it, minim does it minimal, does this particular regulation minimally impair the right? Could you have d accomplished the same objective um, through some less onerous um, um, form of regulation? One can, one can take that extremely seriously or one can take that somewhat less seriously and make room for reasonable decision making by legislatures, make room for, um, for, for certain kinds of fiscal decision making. Um, one need not um, be doctrinaire or formalistic about it, the, 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 but the point is that um, that the, the the kinds of questions, the set of questions you are asking, remain the same set of questions um, uh, uh, and, and don't change in in advance anticipation of what might result from doing so. Professor Case. Uh, so I have an anecdote and a question resulting for Jamal. The anecdote is the following. Um, my first semester teaching ever at the University of Virginia, I taught First Amendment, and I prepared my exam very carefully, but I wanted to run it by my colleagues. And one of my questions was exactly your constitutional amendment taken from the Canadian Constitution and discuss with respect to any two or three areas studied in this course, what difference, if any, this would make if this were a part of the U.S. Constitution? And I showed it to the two colleagues, Ted White and David Martin. And one of them said, both of them said, this is a great question. And one of them said, it's a great question and it would make all the difference in the world. And the other said, it's a great question and it would make no difference at all. <laughs> being a law professor, I don't remember which one of them said it, just like being a law professor, I always remember the question and never how it's decided. Um, <laughs> But the question that results is, uh, the, I mean, the commentator's suggestion that this came from Germany, I think it actually came from the European Convention of Human Rights. And there's an interesting difference between the way that these sort of what I call second paragraph limitations in the European Convention are phrased. Um, those are phrased subject to such limitations as are necessary. And the Canadians, by contrast, say subject only to such limits as can be demonstrably justified. Our constitution is absolute, which means that the Canadians are textually in the middle between the two of us, um, between, the, you know, between the Europeans and, and the Americans. Um, I, I have to say, I line up with the idea that it makes little difference at all. Given that our constitution was already absolute, won't this just encourages further in the direction of limitation, that is to say, have the effect of being like the Europeans, 
rather than have, have the effect of the Canadians do, which is to push away from the Europeans toward the absolutism of the Americans. Uh, so uh, I don't think our constitution is absolute. Uh, I think our constitution does not... The text. Right, oh, I, don't think our, I think our constitution does not textually specify a limitations clause, but that's question begging because one can understand rights as, in, as having inherent limitations. This is a philosophical question that I don't think is answered by the constitutional text. It's answered by uh, the way in which constitutional doctrine develops over time and the way in which ours has developed over time is that rights are not in fact absolute, but we, we, we act as if they are. Um, we, take, we adopt that posture towards rights, and the, precisely the way in which it matters is not in any individual doctrinal error. I can take any, we can take any case and say, well, yeah, I can, I can see how we'd arrive at the same result in this particular case if we adopted this kind of language as opposed to what we do. Uh, my, my concern is in other cases. My concern is in how you approach the rights inquiry in the first place. Do you think that what you are doing when you're adjudicating a constitutional right is declaring an exception from government regulation um, that is in, in, in its nature exceptional? Uh, or do you understand what you're doing as, uh, as providing uh, a litigant with an option to demand justification of the government's actions? Uh, and I think that in a, dis in a society in which we assume that there are mature and functioning democratic institutions, that that is the more, that asking a question about justification is a more appropriate inquiry than asking about a question about exceptions. Um, so, uh, uh, so would it push us more in the direction of limitation? I don't know. Uh, I'm not committed to that in uh, one way or the other, uh, uh, I, but I am committed to a, a certain sense of transparency and a certain sense that um, what we should be doing is, again, encouraging deliberation rather than declare, uh, in, in a sort of hubristic way, declaring that the court can, in some, through some interpretive, through masterful uh, uh, constitutional interpretation, declare the way in which rights should be understood in a democratic society. This is a question for Lord Donahue. I, I don't uh, contest that there have been enormous abuses in gathering information electronically and otherwise, certainly in the wake of our national security crises <laughs> or anything of that sort. But in looking at your amendment specifically and in its wording, I think your amendment puts a lot of pressure on the phrase personal information. Uh, and there is this unavoidable circularity in defining what is personal, right? We have intuitive ideas about what's personal, but on the other hand, once we have all of these, this electronic infrastructure, by definition, that infrastructure that supports a lot of our communications is shared. Uh, there's other information like the movement of our car or of our vehicles that can be readily observed. The Supreme Court sort of finessed that whole problem with the GPS uh, decision. Uh, so I guess I, I'm not expecting you to give me a plenary definition for personal information, but I'm just wondering you know, what you have in mind there and how you're going to draw the lines on that. Okay. I, yeah, thanks. Obviously, the court would be part of drawing the lines and perhaps statutory definitions part of understanding the scope of these issues. Um, my concept of this is information dealing with personhood, so who you are as a person, what you do uh, as a person. So the Fourth Amendment doctrine doesn't recognize any use restriction in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it doesn't recognize uh, the idea that once a company holds your information that you can then have any uh, control or ownership over that information. And so my concept of personal information that I'm looking for in this amendment is this idea that even if somebody else has access to that information, so instead of coming from the informant doctrine line of cases that once you divulge it to somebody else, you lose access to it. That was White just after Katz, that White came out and said, no, in fact, informant doctrine is un untouched. I'd want to see an, a new body of law of doctrine that basically says, no, once somebody has your information, you still have a right to control over that information to the extent that it defines who you are, what you do and it gives you insight into that individual themselves. Um, on, the, on the observing cars in public space, I've always found this 
a really curious, uh, you know, uh, that we would think, in, in the Jones case, you're right, in 2012, Justice Scalia decided that case based on trespass, but there was a shadow majority in that case, right? So Justice Sotomayor and Justice Alito both wrote in that case and said, look, we would question the idea whether 28 days surveillance, there is no privacy interest that's, that's entailed in that 28 days surveillance. Sotomayor went so far as to say she would jettison third party doctrine altogether, potentially. Um, what's really curious is, you know, we have, if, if a person did that, in the United States, uh, we think that's kind of weird. In fact, that's kind of creepy, right? If somebody followed you around for 28 days, you could get a temporary restraining order on them, right? So it strikes me as really odd that we allow the government to collect that information when if another citizen did it, we wouldn't allow it. So I think there are standards uh, entailed in personal information that we can look to what you would allow others to do. Would we allow you to drive, you know, to fly a drone over our property and look through the second story window without any challenge? No. So I think the police should have a warrant to collect that kind of information. So to some extent, I also think that the definition of personal information could be set by social standards in terms of what we would expect another citizen to be able to access about us. It strikes me as deeply problematic that you would waive that in the case of a government when they have all of these additional coercive mechanisms and devices like jail, execution, you know, other devices available to them, the coercive powers of the state, I think it should be a much stricter standard to have access to that same information. Okay, we have one final question. Uh, good afternoon. I also have a question for Laura Donahue. Um, in looking at your proposed amendment, uh, could you share with me the rationale for including the last statement under that, the Electoral College? Yeah. Uh, could you explain that to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I was running out of time and I didn't want to run over. Um, so, so I have two reasons uh, for that statement. Uh, first is one of the principal reasons at the time for Electoral College had to do with access to information and knowledge of the individuals involved. We don't live in that era anymore. We live in one in which we all have access to information and news um, and we can challenge it and get more information. And so I think one of the basic rationales for the Electoral College has gone away. Um, and the second reason comes down to two words, uh, pretty much, uh, enough already. <laughs> Enough already, right? You know, it's, it's time to let the majority of the people in this country decide who is president. And did you mean to base it on residency rather than citizenship? Oh, no. Okay. Citizenship. <laughs> citizenship. How about one last round of applause for this panel?